Hello and welcome. My name is Kevin Featherstone and I'm director of the Hellenic Observatory here at the London School of Economics. Thank you for joining us. Today's event is part of a UK-wide series of public events to commemorate the bicentenary of the Greek War of Independence. And you can find out further information about these events uh, from the website 21in21.co.uk. Uh, if you look, if you're watching on Zoom, you can find the link in the chat uh, function uh, here. And there are upcoming events, particularly in the autumn at Cambridge, King's College London, as well as here at the LSE. Today's event goes, of course, to the very heart of the economic history of modern Greece. It raises many themes, both national and international. The title for today is The Greek War of Independence, Reappraising Its Economic Legacies. And I'm delighted that we have such an expert panel to guide us through the relevant issues. So let me pass over to my very good LSE colleague, Professor Joanne Roses of the Economic uh, History Department here at the school. Joanne, over to you. Thank you, Kevin. <clears throat> Welcome to everybody to this meeting today. And we will discuss how far the economic problems of the modern Greece state can be attributed to the nature of its origins. It's a small, albeit enlarged size, the lack of popular trust in public institutions and authority, the recourse to patrons and rent seeking, and its over vulnerability to external power, artists' path dependence features that overlap the scope for change, how much this is related to history, how much is related to the origins of the state. This panel will discuss, in, in another words, the inheritance of 8021 for the course of development taken by Greece and how it has structured options and choices. How much of the, what today is happening in the Greece economy and the Greek society depends on the origins of the, of the country? When and how has or mixed such historical determinism be overcome? How Greece can uh, avoid this historical legacy? How the Greece can change this past to change of uh, the country? We have today three speakers, the very interesting speakers. Maria Cristina Hasioanu, and is director of the Institute of Historical Research at the National Hellenic Research Foundation. She is also editor of the Historical Library for 8021, supported by the Lazaridis Foundation. And, uh, and her latest publication is Entangled History and Collective Identity, Narrative of Kios Massacre. We have also um, Andreas Kakridis, that is Assistant Professor of Economic History at the Union University in Corfu. Since 2007, he has also served as the scientific advisor to the historical archive of the Bank of Greece. He has taught at the University of Athens, at the Pantheon University, and also has been visiting fellows at the University of Columbia, New York. And finally, we have Statis Calibas, that is Gladstone Professor of Government at the Department of Politics and International Relations, University of Oxford, and fellow of All Souls College. Until 2008, he was Arnold Wolfers Professor of Political Science at Yale University, where he founded and directed the program on order, conflict, and violence, and co-directed the Hellenic Studies program. He has written extensively on civil wars, ethnicity, and political violence. He has an additional interest in the history of politics of Greece. Okay, how, how we can contact with us? We have a Twitter account for those Twitter users in the audience. The hashtag for today event is Hashtag LSC Greece, this means very simple. For recording, it's very important that this online event is being recorded. And if everything works well and we don't have uh, technical problems, will be made available in video and also in, in podcast. And finally, if you want to make us questions, we have the QA open in the system. <clears throat> to submit your question, please use this uh, option that is in Zoom below. And I try to make a selection of the different questions to try to organize a bit of the debate. If you don't expect an all question, we'll consider it. Also, you can, you can consider questions to the event in, in Facebook on live, and we also will try to, to take the questions if it's possible. Okay, now I let uh, the, the word to Maria Cristina, please. Hello, good, good afternoon, everybody. Now, the commemoration of the 1821 revolution 
is different from its historical understanding. And this is something that all the speakers of this panel know well. The Greek revolution cannot be understood through teleological interpretation. The Greek revolution, it is best seen as an open procedure of experimentations with failures and achievements, continuities and ruptures. My first observation regarding economic legacies is that facing the Greek revolution and its economic after aftermath does not mean that a strictly chronological process will help us understand the complexity of economic integration of the various and diverse Greek regions. Not all Greek regions reach the same level of economic integration within the Greek state after 1830. The island of Syros had a completely different pace from Elbia, and Hios economic legacy was different from that of the Peloponnese. The background of the Ottoman economy was predominantly based on agriculture, diverse geographical realities, and different economic networking, which led to distinctive differences between regions inhabited by the Greeks. A serious result of this process was that new markets and resources were linked to the Greek state at different periods. Therefore, state building and the economic process were particularly complex, mainly for political and environmental reasons. The macroeconomy of this Ottoman Greek and subsequently Greek regions after the 1830s portrayed a fragmented economic life characterized by self-consumption patterns in commodity production, external trade and manufacture, tax farming, and private lending. The inhabitants of these regions were familiar with widespread practices and customs that characterize their commercial, ecclesiastical, and communal world, which underwent transformations due to the new realities created by the revolution. I will focus on two issues that are tightly related to the modern procedures that took place during and because of the Greek revolution with different outcomes. The first issue, which was the management of the first Greek loans of the 1824 and 1825 proved to be unsuccessful. The two loans acquired by the Greeks during the War of Independence were of reduced nominal value from the 2.8 billion pounds, about half of the money reached the hands of the Greeks, 1.4 million. It was a strategic move lost between three asymmetric worlds. First, the world of the revolutionary Greeks, which was characterized by the archaic capitalist relations of the Ottoman economy, to the world of the Greek trade diaspora of international transactions, and three, the world of the newborn financial city of London. Their importance was not confined to the public finances of the Greek state. In fact, the first loans were used as a political argument for the international recognition of the future state, but also as a pretext for coercion or blackmail in Greece's diplomatic relations. Ultimately, they functioned as the original sin that, bar that burdened the country symbolically. The first Greek loans constituted right from the start a typical example of the interwining of economic expectations with cultural components. This was a characteristic case of deficiency in local and international experience for the Greek revolutionaries. The other issue, it is quite successful. State regulations for the protection, for the protection of the ancient monuments, ruins and objects in the Greek lands since 1822. The provisional administration of Greece 
demonstrated an early concern for the protection of ancient monuments when it declared that the Ministry of the Interior was responsible for excavating and protecting ancient ruins. This is the basis for the appeal for one of Greece's main strong points to the rest of the world, a main pillar together with nature for attracting tourism. Summing up, these are the two issues that I chose to follow to better comprehend the economic legacies of Greece. The first issue, the first launch of the Greek independence did not work well. The second issue, although it may at first seem odd, constituted a strong asset in the economic life of the new state. Greek antiquities and, the Greek and their importance for the Greek state was related later in time with tourism, the so-called heavy industry of the country. I think that uh, focusing on contemporary journeys of tourists for leisure and considering tourism as commercialized hospitality and a modern variety of the traditional pilgrimage, it is important to highlight and appreciate the first state laws regarding the safeguarding of antiquities. So I will stop here on my remarks on what I would call economic legacies and the Greek revolution pitfalls and achievements. Thank you, Maria. I let now to Andreas, please. Thank you very much. My name is Andreas Kakridis uh, and I'm very grateful to be here. Uh, however, virtually, um, being an economist turned economic historian, uh, I'm well aware of the law of diminishing returns. So being the second speaker, I already have to assume that marginal interest has dropped a little. Uh, and there are not as many interesting points uh, to make new ones, especially after the, the two points uh, very um, constructively made by Maria Cristina. But I do think there, there are a few things I can emphasize and indeed perhaps challenge um, as a way to set up our discussion. Uh, so let me start with a challenge, albeit this one is directed at a particular way of thinking about Greece in the long term. Um, I feel it's worth stressing. Public discourse about Greece has long focused on this portrait of the country as the underachiever, as underdeveloped and inadequate. Emphasis has invariably been placed on the things that are missing from it, depending on one's theoretical tradition, although you do get a lot of cherry picking here. Um, what could be missing could be a proper bourgeoisie, a modern bureaucracy, an efficient bureaucracy, an industrial revolution, uh, markets that function well, social capital, you name it. Um, if you take a quick glance at the way the questions framing tonight's event uh, were phrased, you show how just how, how ubiquitous this is. The kick of question, and, and uh, Juan actually um, reminded us, uh, is how far may Greece's problems be attributed to its origins? So from the get-go, the focus is on problems. Now, I suspect that part of the intention was to spark this very discussion, and I'm sure Maria Christina and Stathis are gonna echo um, my sentiment, but the fact remains that many of you watching tonight probably didn't think twice about this when you read about the event, how you felt this was an apt description of Greece's trajectory. And whenever I'm confronted with this attitude, my mind always wanders back to this um, line from Seferis's poem, Helen, where Tefkros laments that his fate was that of a man who missed his target. It's a beautiful verse. Huh? And not because, not just because of the lyric pessimism, but also because of this implicit assumption of a given target, a trajectory along which Greece is expected to travel, but fails to hit the mark. So I, I think it's important to start with a blunt formulation in, in some in partial antithesis to this and say that the single most important legacy, economic or otherwise, of the Greek War of Independence was the establishment of the modern Greek state a state that for all its shortcomings started off as a very poor malaria infested 
backwater agrarian province of the Ottoman Empire, where life expectancy was about 40 years. And over the span of the next 200 years, trebled in size, added more than 10 million souls to its population of about 1 million and joined a select club of developed nations. This is the same state where average income started around $2,000 a year in today's prices. Whereas by the end of this year, now assuming everyone gets vaccinated and those of you who are watching abroad rush to book your holidays to Greece, so you invest the appropriate amount of money into the economy, assuming these things happen, per capita GDP for Greece is expected to reach about $23,000 this year. So that's about 12 times higher. And while these historical estimates invariably have to be taken with a pinch of salt, uh, there is little doubt that Greece is today the richest of the successor states of the Ottoman Empire. So I think any legacy of Greece's independence should start, any discussion of the legacy of independence should start with that. And it should also recognize that this trajectory was neither linear nor predetermined. Now, with that caveat in mind, uh, which I suspect we might return to, I should also want to mention uh, three legacies, three historical legacies uh, of the way in which the Greek state started its life. So I'm taking a slightly broader focus, not just the revolution as such. Now, the obvious starting point is size. Greece starts out small, and in fact, very small. And this has implication for how susceptible it is to geopolitical forces, and what relationship it has to great powers, including financial relations that uh, Maria Cristina already uh, alluded to. These were less detrimental than is often claimed, uh, and in fact, they were often beneficial, but they certainly imposed constraints on domestic policy. Uh, so did this, the fact that the market was small, which discouraged import substitution and generally meant that Greece would invariably have to seek to uphold its access to foreign markets. Uh, not least in the 20th century by joining trading blocks like the EEC. Um, Greece's smallness from the outset uh, also increases the fiscal burden of establishing a state apparatus. And to, this to my mind, this contributes to another familiar cliche that of the oversized hypertrophic Greek state, which we might also end up discussing. Now, most of this is typical of small states. In fact, many of these points were raised in, in the literature in, on, about Western small states, say Katzenstein and so on. What is less typical, and this is my second point, is Greece's incompleteness. So it's not only small, it's also, it also feels that it's incomplete, that it, from the onset, it, it perceives itself as the rightful heir to the Ottoman Empire in Europe and focuses on expanding its borders. Uh, a few decades later, of course, after the revolution, uh, it would be joined by other nations aspiring to compete for a share of the Balkans. Uh, but this is very important. The economic implications of what we, uh, as uh, specialists on Greece, talk, talk, talk about in terms of the Megali there, as well as this Balkan interstate competition, should not be underestimated. They are the focal point of Greek policy for the long 19th century. They galvanize state building efforts. They shape the way the state was actually built, the way, for example, roads and railroads are laid out, the conduct of monetary policy, the pursuit of international loans, and of course, the conduct of war itself. Uh, whenever the strategy is successful, it expands the country's territories. And this also has economic implication in terms of new opportunities and new challenges, because most of the lands that are usually incorporated are less developed. Uh, and when it fails, as it did for the last time in 1922, uh, it also has far-reaching economic implications. Uh, and the third point I would like to make concerns this a particular configuration of power that emerges from 1821, which conditions, in my opinion, um, the political economy of the newly established state. Um, this is a familiar theme. I just think it should be put on the table. On the one hand, you have the absence of a landed aristocracy. On the other, you have a war of independence that relies heavily on the mass mobilization of the peasantry. So if you combine the two, what you get um, is an important and somewhat unusual feature of the new state, 
the relative power of this small holding or non, no holding peasantry in a country that is only weakly stratified. And this soon becomes institutionalized through universal male suffrage, which was established much earlier than elsewhere. To my mind, this is an important legacy, which reverberates, reverberates throughout modern Greek history. Its economic implications are manifest early on in the prolonged ambivalence with which the Greek state um, treats the privatization of public lands or national lands. Rather than selling them to the highest bidder, the state holds on to public lands, turning a blind eye to the gradual encroachment of its own property rights. Incidentally, um, this blurry line between what is private and what is public uh, is something that many would argue still exists today and causes some of Greece's problems. Uh, others would in fact perhaps suggest that the legacy of Islamic law where all lands belong to the Sultan, but farmers enjoyed significant rights to cultivate, played a role here. I think that's less important. The important thing remains the decision to tolerate, if not sometimes discreetly encourage this behavior, which reflects the relative bargaining position of the peasantry in the absence of a powerful elite. And this balance of power is reaffirmed uh, with the influx of the refugees from Asia Minor 100 years later which again favors social stability over efficiency, for example, agricultural efficiency. And small-scale peasant ownership is uh, reaffirmed in the countryside, just as it is spreading to the cities. So shopkeepers, small-scale business owners, the self-employed employed the scores of uh, public ho private homeowners collectively enjoy considerable bargaining power in the political economy of the modern Greek state. Again, let me be clear, I'm not suggesting that this is necessarily good or bad. In fact, I would suggest it's both and it has both sides. Uh, nor do I think that its effect is constant over time, but I do think that it constitutes an important part of Greece's political economy, which helped shape its trajectory over the long term. How and why is something that I think we could probably discuss in the course of this evening, and I look forward to that discussion. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, studies, please, your turn. I hope you can hear me. I'm having some uh, computer problems today. Yeah. Uh, and uh, coming uh, at the heels of the previous two speakers, in a sense, takes a lot of fire out of my own remarks, because inevitably, um, I'm going to repeat some of the points that were already made. Um, I would argue that uh, there are three types of effects that we can identify when we're trying to trace uh, the effects uh, of an original uh, set of events uh, to present day outcomes. Uh, and this is where very often uh, potential pitfalls may lie. So we may identify situations in which we can plausibly argue that there is uh, a relation, perhaps a causal relation between origin and outcome. Uh, that would be the first type of relationship. There is a second type of relationship in which we can uh, certainly plausibly and perhaps even forcibly argue that there is no relation. Uh, in fact, the relation is negative between the origins and the outcomes. And, that, uh, and then there is a third type of effect, which in my uh, uh, opinion is, is very often uh, both very common and overlooked, in which there is no relation between the two. Uh, too many things intervene between the two uh, to, in, uh, to allow us to make a, a strong claim between uh, the two uh, variables of interest, the origins and the outcomes. So to illustrate uh, that, I, I'll make um, uh, three, I'll give you three examples of the three types of events. Uh, I'm going to argue first, following on Andreas's points, that a lot of the outcomes that we observe today uh, in Greece um, are not related uh, to the origins uh, of the Greek states uh, and the Greek nation. Greece today. Also, a peaceful society in which politics uh, is disconnected, decoupled from violence. Um, all of those three outcomes are unrelated uh, to the origins. Greece emerges 
as a uh, state that is absolutist, uh, even though there is an attempt during uh, the events of the war of independence uh, to promulgate uh, liberal constitutions. It is a state uh, that, uh, when it emerges uh, from the Ottoman Empire, is extremely poor. And finally, uh, is a state uh, that is born through a set of civil wars. Uh, so I would argue that there is no uh, clear connection between the way uh, Greece emerges on uh, the uh, international scene on the one hand and its present condition on the other hand. Uh, when it comes uh, to, to situations that are probably, that look very similar and perhaps look connected but are not, uh, here my example are going to be the points emphasized by the first speaker, uh, the loans of Greece. It is very tempting to argue that the way in Greece the way in which Greece stumbled uh, in, in uh, the international Eurozone crisis in 2010, the mismanagement of resources and its inability uh, to pay back its loans is associated with its original sin, so to speak, uh, of having received and being unable uh, to repay uh, loans that were uh, meant to finance uh, its core of independence. And in fact, uh, various economic historians uh, most notably um, uh, papers uh, that seem or try to connect Greece's um, uh, mismanagement uh, of external funding uh, and its inability to repay uh, loans can be traced back uh, to, to, to its history. I would argue that this is a very um, obvious, in my mind, example of a correlation uh, that is not causation. There is a similar pattern which can be uh, very interesting as a starting point for a discussion, but I would argue that there is no causal relation. And finally, I would like to focus on the positive, uh, which um, present day uh, institutions or behaviors can be traced back uh, to the origins uh, of the modern Greek states uh, and the Greek war of independence. Uh, I would make three points here. Uh, my first point, uh, uh, also echoes uh, a point made by Andreas, his last point. Um, I would argue the way in which Greece is uh, socially stratified uh, during the Ottoman Empire can be characterized as a system of ranked ethnicity. This is a, a term used by Donald Horowitz and other students of ethnicity to characterize situations in which there is a very strong overlap between ethnicity uh, and class. That is, the Ottomans are also uh, the major landowners. So the removal of the Ottomans um, allows Greek elites to make a choice. In class with local, they are going to um, proceed in a different way, which is what they did, um, nationalize those lands and eventually redistribute them, which is going to create, as Andreas pointed out, uh, a nation of uh, small cultivators yeoman farmers, uh, which is going to be an essential feature uh, of its democratic politics and political life for two centuries. Greece remains to this day a nation of small owners, uh, of small companies, of small business. Uh, and I think that uh, can be traced not to the war of independence per se, but to the choices that were made independently uh, after that war of independence. Uh, the second point I would like to make is that insofar as we can trace some sort of a causal legacy, it is clear that the regions, and that was uh, the point uh, made uh, by uh, Maria Cristina, uh, it is clear that the regions that were integrated originally into the Greek state are going to have an early uh, mover advantage in staffing uh, the emerging bureaucracy. And in fact, uh, we can see that uh, since uh, the Greek War of Independence, uh, regions, uh, uh, especially the Peloponnese, which were the core uh, of the new Greek state, uh, tend to be overrepresented in the major uh, public institutions, the state bureaucracy and the military, for instance. So this is uh, a situation in which uh, being first, so to speak, uh, has an effect, but at the same time, it is not uh, a very interesting point, politically speaking. It doesn't allow us to draw uh, a connection with outcomes such as uh, trust uh, to institutions uh, or patronage. Uh, the same would have been the case if other uh, regions would have joined uh, first or if the public administration was staffed in a different way. Um, the final point that I would like to make 
is uh, perhaps the most uh, speculative on my part, but perhaps also uh, the one that has the most interesting potential. And I would like to argue that the structure of cleavages that dominates Greek politics could perhaps be traced in the cleavages that became apparent when uh, the Greek War of Independence emerged. Um, those can be identified uh, more uh, likely with the divisions that led to the uh, civil wars that erupted during the War of Independence, uh, in which we had on the one hand um, actors that were primarily characterized by their domestic uh, routing, uh, fighting against political actors that were for the most associated uh, with um, economic, political, and social characteristics that locate them outside of the realm uh, of uh, the new nation or of the areas in which uh, most of the fighting took place during the War of Independence. Uh, eventually, this cleavage uh, was described as the cleavage between the uh, autochton, uh, the autochthonous Greece, Greeks and the heteroctonous Greece, Greeks, and it became uh, one of the first uh, formative um, lines of division uh, in early modern Greek politics. Uh, one could make the argument that a lot uh, of the process uh, that ha has characterized the ways in which Greeks have uh, faced each other politically is somehow weakly, but perhaps still uh, there, associated with this uh, early cleavage line. On the one hand, uh, you have those uh, who are very much um, bent on promoting and protecting the rights uh, of so called insiders, of those who uh, have obtained uh, a number of um, uh, privileged positions just because they were there when everything started, that they're rooted locally. And on the other hand, you have um, uh, the aspirations, uh, the political preferences, uh, the proclivities uh, of those who are um, looking towards the outside, coming from the outside, derive part of their income, uh, from uh, pursuits that are not necessarily associated with the local economy uh, in its uh, autarkic uh, dimension. Uh, one perhaps very interesting line of cleavage uh, that is likely to be uh, very active in, in, in the near future uh, is probably going to be associated with the political activities of the estimated um, 400,000 Greeks who left Greece during the last crisis and emigrated uh, in uh, uh, other European countries. Uh, very often these people were younger, more dynamic uh, and more skilled uh, than the people who stayed behind. Uh, they have not lost contact with Greece. Uh, They're still looking to Greece as their country of origin. They are likely either to be back or to take a very strong interest in Greek politics. And so it would be very interesting to see how their characteristics, how their makeup uh, is likely to influence uh, political antagonism in Greece uh, in the years to come. Again, I wouldn't argue that this can be traced back to the origins, but I would certainly uh, make the point that there seems to be a line of cleavage here that appears to be recurring and appears to inform uh, the way in, Greek, in which Greek politics uh, is organized. So I'm, I'm going to stop here and thank you very much for uh, the opportunity. Okay, now we have uh, opportunity for the questions and the debate. I, I will put a general question for everybody. Uh, how much, how is now Greece is consequence of the nature of the, of the Ottoman state? How much is consequence of to have a very interventionist state and how much Greek has really break with the Ottoman Empire uh, heritage in terms of the organization of the state? Or Maria, what, what do you think? Yeah. Well, uh, the legacy of the Ottoman Empire is a legacy that we cannot deny, and there is no reason to deny, I think. Uh, a revolution, uh, civil wars are things that happen during the 19th century everywhere. There is no reason that we say that we had a rupture with the Ottoman Empire. This was a gradual political uh, um, a, a gradual political uh, evolution and functionally it didn't work all the time because there were the Greeks in Istanbul, in Constantinople, 
that they always had their relations with the, what we call Ottoman Empire and also the Asia Minor Greeks. So there were parts of Greeks, of Greece, that they had stronger affiliations with the Ottoman, what was Ottoman Empire and the successor, the uh, Turkey, the successor state. Um, what I would like to argue now, it's something else that uh, I'm happy that we are doing some disassociations that it's true. It's not to blame the uh, Greek revolution, but uh, I would like to stress the power relations between two different worlds. The local elites, wherever there were these local elites, of course, the Peloponnese and Stereia Elada, Central Greece and the diaspora Greeks. These, these are the two, let's say, worlds that we have to look after and follow their paths. This is a good example to follow a path dependency uh, session. Thank you. Uh, I, we have another related question that is probably, do you feel that there is a relation between uh, pro-European and pro-East Greeks still remain now between the, the, the Eastern looking and the European looking, the two groups, or is much more now a, re, a regional problem, a regional difference? That is, I think, that talk about these two kinds of Greek uh, groups. Uh, yes, perhaps I could answer that question. Uh, very often we see that uh, in many uh, public opinion surveys, there is a large proportion of respondents who uh, uh, looks uh, in a very positive light uh, towards um, uh, the, the so-called East, especially Russia. Um, it is tricky to interpret. Uh, my uh, sense is that it's not necessarily uh, Russia, but Russia is seen as, as a sort of model uh, to Greece, but it, it is very often a shortcut that allows those who are uh, of the, uh, uh, I would argue, the very aggressive uh, A sort of uh, alternative narrative. Uh, but what is very interesting uh, is also that um, uh, from the very beginning, uh, the way in which Greek politics is organized uh, is very much along uh, political parties uh, whose uh, inclinations are associated with uh, their foreign connections. So the British party, the French party, and the Russian party, uh, which are loosely associated with these kinds of preferences. Uh, so you could argue that there is, from the very beginning, uh, a, a very a more aggressively pro-Western tendency and a more defensive, uh, localistic ones that uh, re-emerges every time then, uh, that uh, major choices have to be made. However, what is very interesting as well uh, is that if we were to adopt um, a much more um, historical uh, reading of the Greek War of Independence, we would um, recognize or we would have to accept that it is, in a sense, a vision um, and a decision that is driven very much by those uh, who uh, want to, in a sense, um, overcome what they see as a geographic disadvantage uh, of Greece. The fact that Greece is located to east in their own preference, their own ideas, their own ideologies uh, of these people, uh, people who are active in the friendly society, who devise the political program of the modern Greek nation states and um, the national revolution, um, is very much rooted uh, in this idea that Greece belongs to the West, whatever that means, and needs to rejoin Western nations. And so uh, this is going to, uh, to be uh, an almost uninterrupted line uh, throughout modern Greek history, this uh, eagerness and the political uh, voluntarism that goes with it to overcome everything that can be, in a sense, uh, be said to be associated with the Ottoman legacy. So even though the Ottoman legacy does exist, it's not easy to identify, and certainly the tendency is to see everything that is negative as being the result of the Ottoman legacy, which is wrong. I would argue that what perhaps is a legacy of the Greek War of Independence, is the willingness uh, to escape from that legacy, whatever it might be. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a, a question for Andreas. 
when you talk about this difference between this uh, uh, faster economic growth of, of Greece uh, regarding to another uh, older Ottoman uh, uh, parts of the Ottoman Empire, how much is related to be part of the European Union or how much is before the European Union? Or more generally, how much is the relation with Europe? Explain this. Um, well, most of what, I, first of all, I didn't necessarily speak of high growth alone. I said high level. So Greece also actually starts off um, uh, richer than some of the other, the starting point is richer than some of the other Balkan uh, countries. And that also contributes to the persistent divergence. Uh, but most of it is before uh, the EEC association, um, let alone the accession. So the difference uh, exists almost from the start uh, and, and persists and at times uh, expands. Um, having said that, obviously the actual trajectory is influenced by uh, Greece's relationship with the rest of the world. Part of the smallness argument, and, and again, we shouldn't overlook it, is that that means that the country receives, its, its trajectory is very much determined by geopolitical forces in the area and by its relationship with other uh, powers. Um, I cannot imagine Greece's post-war trajectory, for instance, without American aid and the Marshall Plan. Uh, I cannot imagine um, Greece without foreign intervention during the War of Independence. So of course, if the question is broader, uh, to what extent does Greece's relationship with, um, with its neighbors and with the, with the global system um, matter? Of course it does, as it does for other countries. Uh, the fact that uh, some of the old, other Balkan states are poor right now cannot be seen independently from the fact that they found themselves on, on, um, on the as satellites to the Soviet Union for several decades. So that's, that's pretty straightforward to me. Uh, if I might um, pick up on something that um, was asked before, um, given the chance, um, I do agree that the legacy is there, the Ottoman legacy, but if the question about how much of the current Greek state is, um, you can see the Ottoman legacy in it, if you narrow it to the Greek state, I think, again, we shouldn't emphasize the continuity. I think um, we should remember this is a state that is created almost from scratch and often in deliberate rejection of the status quo ante in terms of legal, institutional framework and so on and so forth. So of course the slate is not completely clean. Um, I can, being an economic historian, I can talk about Ottoman tax practices. They could not change overnight. Uh, and I think Maria Christina suggested this, uh, and they were only gradually phased out. But in most of the policy areas, the overwhelming sense over the 200 years is that of a complete overhaul, not of st stasis. That's why I'm, I would be very, uh, I mean, I wouldn't be able to give a, an exact number that this percent of the modern Greek state is uh, modern, but I would say it is, uh, that is where we should emphasize. And this also means I'm, I'm, I'm always a little reluctant to speak of a historical resistance to reform, something that, again, is implicit in some of this, um, in the phrasing of tonight's discussion. Um, I think, again, we are telescoping present problems, recent experiences to the past and saying there's resistance to reform. There was massive, a massive rupture, at least in terms of the intended uh, outcome. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, we have now several questions about finance, and obviously in Greece is still a very a strong question. And, and I try to summarize in some sense of what I normally teach here at the LSC is that how much do you think that they are a kind of uh, initial scene of Greece because they begin with the history with these initial loans and so much problems and problems of repayment loans and how much he, this legacy has remained until today? I put you the typical example, many of the Latin American countries, the spill, uh, some people even remember that in the 19th century, they don't pay their loans. And, uh, and it's a kind of, of scene that when they go to the market, ever they have to pay this uh, extra payment, even don't have any economic sense today. How much do you feel that this is still is present in, on Greece? Maria, for example. Well, uh, I will answer this uh, obvious question by quoting uh, 
Barry Eichengreen, who wrote that uh, the historical past is a rich repository of analogies that shape perceptions and guide public policy decisions. So why we need the historical past to explain our uh, tax evasion, our uh, loan deficiency, our sovereign uh, uh, deficiency, uh, there is no use that we go to the past. I mean, we have the present and we can judge it with uh, our tools. And uh, this is my opinion. It's not that, of course, there is complete rapture with the past, but I think it's time to dis disassociate these things. Then we can find another world, the Mediterranean world. Then it's the Ottoman world. We can find whatever we like and find excuses, explain things. These analogies, I think, are a bit difficult to, to follow. I have another question for studies about uh, similar things. The question is, um, what is the relation between external debt and the creation of these uh, groups that are pro-British, pro-Russian and French political parties after the revolution? How much this is related to this relation with the international markets and the post-revolution? And, and, and how this could be this, uh, a reflex on this uh, uh, political opinion on this so divided. How much this is an heritage of that, or is this absolutely new and is a recent creation? This is from uh, uh, Professor from so, College. Thank you very much. Uh, probably, I would, as far as I know, there isn't a close association between um, the initial loans and the three parties. Um, and I would generally argue that uh, throughout the course of Greek history, uh, the uh, willingness to seek uh, external assistance and external resources tends to be, especially from the West, tends to be endogenous uh, to a group, uh, a group's preferences. That is, the groups that have uh, always traditionally been in favor of Greece's close association with the West have also been, uh, at the same time, seeking the means to make that association happen. Um, in a sense, you can think of uh, Greece's um, non-Western uh, characteristics being more of the default situation. That is, if you don't do anything, you are likely to, in a sense, move uh, towards the East. In order to move towards the West, you have to do a lot of things. Uh, you have to seek a lot of resources. You have to push the country sometimes beyond uh, its um, capabilities. Um, uh, to use a metaphor that has been brought forward in, in various points in time in Greek history, you have to jump into the sea, even if you do not know how to swim and hope that you will learn uh, swimming after you've jumped. Uh, so uh, to the extent that there is a relationship, I would argue that uh, uh, the uh, groups that have sought to move Greece towards uh, uh, the West have been uh, very often associated with, uh, uh, with looking for resources uh, for, from that uh, direction rather than the other way around. We have several questions about uh, state capacity. And uh, uh, it's very interesting because even the, the questions are contradictory. One typical question is, how big is the big Greek state? And how much state capacity has really Greek or don't have any state capacity and is a kind of mirage or something? For example, Andreas, do you think that the Greek state is so big or so different? Or what made the or not is is apparently big and is not so big. Yes, I, I was afraid it was going to come to that at some stage. Um, so this is this is uh, I, I hinted at as, as being a historical cliche as well. Um, for the answer I think depends on measurements and metrics and methodological differences. But the the quick response I would give for the nineteenth century is most indicators suggest that yes, Greece, um, the simple comparison suggests that it has a, a big state in terms of how much it um, um, 
spends on the state. Having said that, again, I would relate it to the size of the country. So a, a country that is immediately thrust as a tiny nation state in the 19th century, this is not a country established in the 16th century, needs to set up all the paraphernalia, including the core elements of, of a functioning nation state, especially if it wants to project this image of the model kingdom in the East that mimics the West. And this has enormous setup costs. And I think that is often overlooked, as is the fact that most of these comparisons are based on very rough estimates of um, GDP, which we are not entirely sure we can rely upon, especially in a country that is uh, largely subsistence agriculture. So you have a lot of GDP that you're missing out. So you cannot directly compare the Greek state, say, to the um, British state at the time. And, and think that you're comparing something meaningful. Um, today, because the conversation persists, uh, in, in the sort of post-war period, we, the sense we, we have, and I think other scholars have demonstrated this very successfully, Hilsapsi Urdanoglu being the first name to pop in mind, is uh, that this notion of the state, the Greek state having invariably been big, is false, that, that it actually spent considerable part of its time not being that big. And even today, um, and even before the crisis, in fact, was not uh, much bigger than the average OECD or EU state. The problem was that um, it did not perform as well as one would expect given its size. Well, it's problem number one. The second one is the Greek state did not mobilize sufficient tax uh, revenue to fund that state. So you wanted that size safe, but you didn't actually have the funds to finance it. If by fiscal capacity, by state capacity, we imply the state's capacity to mobilize resources, that is a very interesting um, path of uh, research that is opening up. Uh, again, Greece is not as atypical there, but certainly there, there seems to be a disconnect in recent years. I, I could talk about the 19th century again, but I think the questions are mo mainly asked with a view to the present. Um, there certainly seems to be a, a difference, or clearly was a difference between the resources that the Greek state wanted to mobilize and the resources uh, it was willing to extract to pay for that mobilization. Thank you, Andreas, for the long question. I have a, a related question. How much the problems with the state capacity in Greece are related? Because there are these literature saying that state capacity is strongly correlated with uh, to have a, an enemy outside and to have external wars. How much is related also to these civil wars and these internal problems? How much of the today problem of the state capacity in Greece is because they are much more behind not only the, the uh, enemy in the doors, but also the internal enemy status, for example? What do you think? Well, the, uh, uh, the main civil war in Greece has been a civil war uh, that started uh, during the Second World War and continued after its end. Um, it is indirectly associated with state capacity insofar as it, it, uh, it generated in part uh, an important um, intervention by the United States, uh, which beefed up state capacity following uh, the Second World War and the Civil War. But historically, it's very difficult to find a connection between civil war on the one hand and state capacity. On the, on the other hand, it is much easier to observe, uh, I think Andreas mentioned that, the sort of Tilly, Charles Tilly uh, observation that is um, uh, that the having to do to conduct wars uh, has been a factor that uh, increased state capacity during the 19th century, the decision, for example, uh, to mass mobilize the population in the context of a modern military uh, decision, such as the expansion of the rail network, are all associated uh, with this idea of war, which was an essential uh, component of Greece's original historical mission. Uh, Greece emerges uh, as a uh, land country. Uh, it's uh, the state, the modern Greek state, is, is seen as uh, by no means the definitive one, and therefore. The new, Greek, the new Greek state has to organize in order to pursue a policy uh, of enlargement. Um, the so-called great idea is at the core of the identity of, of modern Greece, and therefore uh, its capacity to fight 
uh, initially against the Ottoman Empire and eventually against um, the Balkan states that compete for some of the same uh, areas, the same land, uh, is going to be fundamental for the Greek state. So yes, uh, the pursuit of uh, uh, enlargement of, of, of um, territorial growth is, is central uh, to the development of uh, state capacity in Greece. And this is true, I would argue, of all European states during that time. Uh, Joanda, uh, if I might. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, Maria. Yeah, Maria yeah. Just, just one word uh, I would like to uh, add here. Um, I think uh, it's another thing to talk uh, about a, a big state in the 19th century, which might be related also with education standards and also with uh, uh, the uh, cities, with the large cities and the exodus to from the rural exodus towards the cities. This is one thing, this continues also to the 20th century. And in the 20th century, uh, the, uh, the large state or the big state or who really goes to this uh, state service to this, uh, it's uh, a certain groups of the population are excluded from uh, uh, for political reasons for, from this uh, state uh, building, isn't it? In the Second World War, after the Second World War, certain parts of the Greek population are excluded from the state building or from this large state. Andreas? Uh, yes, what I, um, I, I find myself in the peculiar position of uh, wanting to say something to Stathis about uh, civil wars which doesn't happen very often as he's the expert, uh, but um, on the matter of war and civil war and state formation, I think the international statistical evidence is always that civil war works against state capacity. And we've seen that um, in, in Greece as well. Uh, the statistical evidence for Greece, although Stathis and I have at times disagreed about the appropriate methodology there, is that the war's um, conflict and war expenditure certainly uh, always precedes periods where you have increases in state capacity in terms of additional taxes. Um, this is certainly true of the interwar period. Um, civil war that diminishes state capacity is actually um, found in the Ethnikos de Cosmos as well. So also after the First World War, we see a period of diminished uh, taxable capacity because of this of, of conflict. Um, the this gives me the opportunity to bring in loans again and the strange ways in which they sometimes function historically. So as Tati said, and I also pointed out this, this important fundamental role of the Megali there in the long 19th century, the quest for expansion and the, and the antagonism to be the first one to reach, um, to, to seize various parts of the Balkans uh, creates this pressure to mobilize, to raise revenues, to create a modern army. This leads to lending, especially when international markets are favorable, to cover these loans. And then when servicing these loans becomes very difficult, in within the next decade or two, you always see this gradual shift in state capacity. So the loan essentially acts as an external pressure. Uh, the war stimulates the lending, and then the lending stimulates the increase in tax capacity. And we see that in two or three cycles in the 19th century. It's a very characteristic pattern. Thanks, Andreas. Statis, do you want to answer to this? Or we can pass to another question. I think that we lost him. Um, we have a related question. Several people are very interested in what is the real, Maria has a big the question in some sense, is what is the relation between the, the po population and the state, the real good relation is an elitist state, is connected with the population in every period of the Greek history, has been the same, has changed across history, is, is something to do with the legacy of how the independence happened or not? I'm not sure that I, I got right the, this question. For, uh, do you mean uh, if the population, uh, the, the number of people demographically? 
There must be people yeah. connected with the state or the state is independent, has no relation with the population, is an elitist state separate from the population. How must the Greek population relate to the state? Is really respond to the interests of everybody or interest in a small elite? This, I'm afraid the sociologist might answer or a political scientist, but uh, I think um, I'm, I, 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 can, I can answer for the 19th century. I can ask for, uh, answer for yeah. nowadays uh, this uh, question of saying the truth. The question is about the 19th century. What, how much the independence produced a real popular state or a very elitist state separate from the society, controlled by a small group? Okay. Um... In, uh, in a state that uh, in the 1830s, it was something like 47,000 square meters. And it had a population something about uh, much less than a million people. And then uh, resources and uh, state capacity, it's uh, quite limited, I would say. So uh, if you compare and you see the demographic evolution and the relation to the state up to now, it is a weak relation, I think. Yes. If I may add to that, um, yeah, please. I would say uh, during the 19th century, Greece, uh, I think Andreas mentioned it before, is one of the states that develops early on uh, one of the most extensive democratic franchises. That is the uh, uh, people who uh, have the right to vote, uh, uh, the population that has the right to vote and elect the government is one of the largest. Uh, and uh, that's one of the earliest moves towards uh, a general male franchise. Uh, and that indicates uh, that insofar as we can use that uh, evidence that the Greek state is certainly uh, much more responsive to the population since the population has the right to vote and therefore elect the government uh, and have a, a key role uh, in the formation of the government. Uh, that's the only relation I know uh, about the interests of the people and the form of the government. Um, otherwise, we're moving in sort of to, in a metaphysical direction in which we think about the popular will and the popular preferences in a way that uh, the people themselves as voters do not. Yeah, we have an, uh, another question related to the state, and it seems I'm excited more to the, to the, to the people than attending, is how, how much the Greek citizens perceive the state in the past and today? They feel that the state is oppressive or is or they really feel that they can participate in the state? What is the personal relation with the state? And probably how much this could explain the problems with taxation and other problems of the Greek state and corruption? Or is it the other side, this corruption and taxation that explain the relation with the population in Greece? Obviously, this has to part of the historical and much more a recent one. This is basically for everybody. <laughs> well, if I, I may take it sort of uh, uh, begin answering that question, which is not easy to answer, but I, I would certainly say we have evidence indicating that the trust to uh, institutions of the state tends to be very low in Greece. Uh, at the same time, uh, traditionally, uh, turnout in elections, uh, at least until the crisis, uh, was uh, very high. Uh, uh, and it's what is very interesting and often forgotten is one of the factors that contributes to high turnout, which is seen as a participatory a dimension uh, in a democracy is polarization. It's political polarization always increases uh, turnout and participation. So there is a contradiction here. Uh, but traditionally, Greek uh, politics have been uh, very polarized and, and uh, characterized by high turnout. Um, and I, th I think these are the two uh, elements uh, that are based on hard data, low trust towards the state, high levels of turnout uh, in the political process. Now, how can you bridge the two? That's a very interesting conversation, very interesting discussion to have, and one that does not necessarily have uh, obvious answers, uh, but certainly uh, worth having.
perhaps Andreas. Yeah, I, uh, that's probably can answer. Something about before the World War II is even this relation, given that Greece has this uh, much more uh, open system or a much uh, much more democratic system with much more open vote, or was not what's the same problems? Well, uh, Greece uh, during the 19th century uh, was quite uh, inclusive. Uh, then, uh, after the so-called uh, national schism, this kind of first uh, civil war that begins in, in 1915, uh, starts experiencing exclusions, but continues to be overall quite inclusive. And I would argue, uh, even after the Second World War, I wouldn't agree with the argument that uh, Greece becomes a state uh, that systematically excludes people. Uh, certainly in terms of voting, um, it it's becomes a society that, uh, in spite of having exited a very uh, bloody civil war, uh, comparatively speaking, is a country that uh, allows uh, the defeated part to participate in a much greater extent than, for example, Spain uh, after its own civil war. Um, it's very interesting, and we don't really know that, uh, but... Uh, there are more people killed by the Francoist regime after the end of the civil war than people killed during the civil war by uh, uh, the military uh, insurgents. Whereas in Greece, uh, executions uh, uh, fundamentally stop with the end of the second world war and a part of the left is able to compete uh, in the first post-war elections in 1950, uh, 1951. Andreas? Uh, yes. Um, well, I agree with Stasi that it's a very interesting conversation to have. I'm not entirely sure we have all the research that we would need to have it. Uh, I'm personally find it very uh, find this. It's a very common feature this discussion of low trust, um, and it's often related to the to the heritage, to you know the Ottoman legacy again. Um, on that, I would point out that by most metrics. Uh, of the, that are used, this is not something unique to Greece as opposed to other European countries, uh, for example, in the Mediterranean or these days in Eastern Europe that had no uh, experience of the Ottoman legacy. So uh, it's, it, it's obviously a little bit more complicated. Uh, I'm also not sure if um, I can be, how do you measure this trust? I mean, today you have these European value surveys and Eurobarometer, but how do you assess the level of trust in the 19th century um, toward the state? How can we be certain that that is, how do we measure and make, and, and what kind of trust do we talk about? These questions today are, do you trust this institution? Um, you could think about the level of trust in a different way. You could think of it in terms of, um, do you, to what extent do you accept major decisions that are made, strategic decisions about the course of the country that are made by the state. And on that level, for instance, in the pursuit of the Megali Vea, there is no uh, doubt that there was unanimity almost behind that idea. There was tactical differences, but the strategy was accepted. Do you accept uh, the course chosen after the Second World War? Do you accept uh, accession to the EEC? Do you, do you share this vision? So in many strategic decisions of the state, of the, you do seem to have um, trust in it. And then when you move, of course, to do I trust my local tax man, you get different kind of reactions. So it's, again, we should pay very close attention to what we're talking about. I have the same feeling about discussions about social capital. Social capital is low because, and this is absolutely true, when asked, Greeks tend to say they don't trust strangers and, and, this, and they, they trust their family members or tight networks more. Um, but then when you look at social capital in terms of participating in uh, labor unions or professional unions or uh, various interest groups, you have considerable participation. When it comes to participating in elections, you have very high participation. So I'm skeptical. I think to a large extent in these cases, we are again transporting um, much of the foreign literature and, and hypotheses without necessarily having done the um, more, uh, pedantic work of, of uh, looking at the nitty gritty details of how we define things in Greece and how we would go about measuring them. Can I say, just add yeah, yeah. one word to what Andrea said now, if I understand well, 
uh, that uh, there is also a, a lack of trustful institutions. So this lack gives way to interpersonal negotiations, right? You have more interpersonal negotiations arguing about how you will solve your problem than you refer to a trustful institution. If I would say you, I, I wouldn't necessarily because, you know, ways of having interpersonal negotiations are also institutions and families are institutions. So I would say you have, um, you feel less certain about certain transactions being taking place right. outside these networks. And uh, your work on the 19th century about these trade networks, of course, shows exactly this sort of thing, how they rely on the internal um, consistency of the network. Um, I have questions related to this in, in the borders, but are, I think, very important. One question that I think several people have already put is that how much this relates to the absence of, of the presence of really social mobility in Greece? How much the society is able to accommodate people going up and down in the social scale, or is a society that is uh, very mobile and the people don't have many confidence and the system allow you to change in your position in the society? And another question related to this is how much this is obviously related to Ottoman Empire, which means the fault of everything that happened in Greece now. How much this is a legacy of the, is an original sin, a uh, consequence of the 19th century? I think one of the common uh, threads that emerged during our discussion is that uh, it's certainly, certainly very imprudent to make these kinds of historical leaps, that is to connect things that we do not like today to things that we do not like in the past. Um, and so people don't like the Ottoman legacy. There are a lot of outcomes today that are not um, liked, but to connect the two, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it cannot, cannot be possibly seen as the result of uh, any, I wouldn't even say serious, but uh, uh, plausibly uh, um, basic understanding of, of social science. So, um, if anything is to come out of our discussion today, uh, it would be to be uh, extremely careful about how we think in terms of connections between the present and the past. Uh, things are very complex, very indirect. Uh, sometimes uh, even things that appear to be uh, very similar tend to be the result of correlations rather than uh, causal relations. So we have to be extremely careful would be the message. And uh, another typical question is how much uh, the history of Greece or the economic history of Greece and the social history is influenced by the external shocks? Because I think many people are worried about the intervention of the foreigners. I think that they remember the European Union. How much these, these many of the decisions in Greece, many of the institutional change are imposed or decided by the Greeks? And, how, and if this is good or bad? But this is a typical question also for, suppose, for the Spaniards, no? How much is good to have the black men visiting your country and it's a bad choice for you? Well, well, again, if I may say so before Andreas, and Andreas can follow up, I would say it's a false dichotomy because historically in Greece, uh, foreign intervention was very often the result of uh, the, the will of the Greeks themselves, that the Greeks pushed for foreign intervention. And this is an example, the best example of that, perhaps, is the Greek War of Independence in which there was active support uh, from the insurgents for foreign intervention in favor of the independence of Greece. So that's why I think the two things are not necessarily opposed. Uh, yes, this is a good uh, opportunity to say that the Battle of Navarino <laughs> was uh, the right exit for the Greek War of Independence. So we are grateful to the Battle of Navarino. Yeah. Andreas? Well, um, I've been uh, more um, discreet in my formulation so far. I'll make it the statement again. The notion that the country would, especially a country of this size, would somehow tra trace its own trajectory independent of external influences is absurd. And um, I was um, there, I was recently reading a letter written by Venizelos, who, you know, not known as the person who would generally 
succumbed to foreign influence, uh, telling Kafadaris, who was his um, so certainly somebody essentially taking over the party in 1926, um, I think, about a foreign a lending plan. And, and Kafandaris was telling him, well, I'm concerned that you know, people are going to say that we're not defending Greece's independence and its, uh, its own uh, rightful path. And he replies and loses much in English, but the, the Greek is brilliant, uh, that you shouldn't worry about that. There is no such thing. Uh, and I think it's it's a false it's a false um, path of research um, as well. Following up on what Staffi says, what what I do find is much more interesting is how these foreign interventions are used by Greeks to overcome uh, internal impasses and distributional squabbles. And very often, the war of independence is not well. I mean, to some extent, it is when it becomes a civil war. But more often than not, even in the recent crisis, you have this, the necessity of the external um, financier and then later external auditor to come in and help sort out a distributional conflict between these fragmented groups uh, that the political system itself is unable to overcome. And that I think is a much more fruitful uh, direction of research. Thank you. We, we have uh, questions in the, in the behind this. This one question, and two people sense very interested, is what is the role of the charged Greek on all this history? If it has any role at all? And what do you think is, is this role has changed with time? I'm, so, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the role of the Greek charge on all this business, what is the role of the Orthodox charge, and how much is mediating what happened on Greece, and how much Greek has it's been independent from the... It's a good question and actually illustrates the point that we've all been making that uh, correlation doesn't mean doesn't uh, match correlation. So the Greek church, um, and I would say the Orthodox religion is a, is, a, is a very important component of the Greek war of independence. In fact, the way in which the insurgents portray themselves are as, uh, is as Christians fighting against Muslims. And that's why their key symbol is the cross. So religion is a very important factor. But at the same time, one of the most important things that happens when the Greek state becomes independent uh, is the creation of the uh, autocephalous uh, Orthodox, Greeks, uh, uh, Orthodox Church of Greece. That is for the first time, there is an Orthodox Church that is independent of the Orthodox Patriarchate uh, in Constantinople. And the reason for that is because there is a sense that you cannot be independent and have a, a, a state church that is beheld be held to, a, to a, your main enemy that is located in the capital city uh, of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, so the church plays a very important role, but from the get-go, the Orthodox Church is a state institution. And even though it has influence within Greek society and perhaps even within the Greek state, it's also true that the Greek state has enormous influence over the Greek Orthodox Church. Uh, the two institutions are very, very closely intertwined uh, and who gets uh, to decide uh, what is, is very often a matter uh, that is a matter of contention within the state. Uh, we have also people interested in how much for Greek development is important this decision to change population with the Turks and other neighborhoods? How much this has changed the Greek history and is good or bad? The people disagree and this has been positive for the Greek history or has been negative in what sense? I think the consensus is that uh, it's been a, a positive development. And there, there, there is a new project right now by uh, a group of economists to try to actually measure uh, at the local level in a more precise way, the uh, exact effects. Uh, but in terms of um, economic development, there is a clear sense that the arrival uh, of a uh, million point five uh, refugees uh, in Greece in 1923 uh, was a very big boost to the, uh, to the economy. Yeah. Another question is how much these people really integrate on Greece or are still a, a group apart? Uh, independent from the rest of Greeks with a different opinion about what happened or different views about the society? Uh, if, if I may say so, because I've been looking into that for my recent research, the answer is no. We don't, we don't have 
uh, for example, in the question of uh, voting behavior, we cannot uh, separate the two groups. So the distinction between natives and refugees, people who came to Greece in 1922-23, has not been ethnified or is not, uh, cannot be traced uh, in voting behavior. Yeah. I ha we have a question for, for, uh, for Maria. Do, do you think that the break of, of, uh, with the Turkish and the independence is a real social break? How much they create a new elite, elite or group of, uh, uh, in charge of the society? Or how much was a continuation of the local groups on the power? Uh, if, if new, if new uh, elites came in power. Yes. Yes, of course, the revolution uh, brought uh, in the scene uh, new persons, and especially persons from uh, the Filigieteria, from elsewhere, uh, it merged people. What's important to understand is that after all this regionalism, which I insist, uh, the local uh, elites in the regional economy, uh, the Greek state builds on an uh, uh, on what it could be a homogeneous economy. So this is important. These new opportunities bring also forth new elites, new elites who want to uh, um, um, buy land here, or open uh, or, or, uh, business opportunities, because right from the start, from the 1830s, we have new people coming to the Greek state, Greeks and foreigners, for this new economic opportunities. Either it can be land, it can be manufacture, it can be uh, uh, lending, uh, uh, private banking, uh, as we could say. Thank you. I have a question for Andreas related to this question. How much this new society that was mainly peasantry based in a small enterprise, independent entrepreneurs, has been good for Greece economic development and has been a hindrance than probably Greek needs according to this uh, question, much more big firms, big competitive firms, and how much has been too much a uh, mini fundis economy with a small firms and a small peasantry and so on. Right, thank you. Um, so again, the answer is not very, it's not historically uh, uniform. Um, and obviously having this fragmented, um, ownership has its advantages and disadvantages. Um, it has contributed to the resilience, for instance, of the Greek agricultural peasant economy. Uh, that means it was with the exception of those who were um, working as traveling to work elsewhere on somebody else's land, most farms were able to withstand crisis. So there was no considerable social uh, agrarian crisis for a long time, at least until you did have the emergence of certain larger lands as the country was expanding. Um, then you also have the resilience uh, of networks operating on these small firms. Um, I, I did see the question in the Q&A and I think the, the uh, speaker was referring to the potential of this being something dynamic. Um, I don't think that is the case. Uh, in fact, Again, it depends on the time you join the, the game. He, the speaker probably has in his mind the idea of you know, early stages of industrial revolution where you have small businesses competing. But then when you try to join the world economy at the stage where Briska does and, and, and with a market that size, uh, you do miss out on all the economies of scale and all of these things that you could, that you could use. Um, and in fact, the existence of these very small firms has not made it, has not prevented the small part of the economy that is actually, that consists of large scale firms to be very oligopolistic. And it's only thanks to our openness to the extent that it exists at various times, especially in the 20th century in the EU, that the effects of these oligopolistic structures have been moderated. Um, one interesting point that to add to this, this um, question of size of business units uh, more today than in the 19th century is how much of it, how much of this accounts for Greece's tax evasion? 
uh, something that many people overlook. There seems to be some sort of, the discussion often is in terms of some kind of genetic flaw uh, or advantage whereby Greeks don't like to pay taxes. But the reality is that the structure of the economy and the fact that you have all these very, very small units um, and all of these self-employed far higher than any of the uh, OECD, well, not OECD, but certainly EU countries, um, explains a lot of your differences in tax compliance. Um, so the question, the more interesting question then becomes, why is this uh, the norm? Why is it, why does the public discourse still support this notion of having this sea of very small quasi-inefficient enterprises that, and whereas we know that they are much more likely to not pay taxes, much more likely not to pay social insurance contributions. And there, I think we do have the echoes. I'm not saying there's a straight line, but we do have the echoes of this fragmentation that starts from the very beginning and the political economy of having um, political power in the hands of all of these small scale owners from the very beginning it is very politically difficult in Greece to go out and say, um, we are actually going to discourage the existence of these small uh, business units, not across the board, but in sectors where we think that there would be a benefit to having larger units. I think that we have time for the last question and it's a difficult one. How much the model of economic growth of Greeks based on tourism, agricultural and shipping is good for Greek, can be changed, I, I think that is funny because this is, uh, if you read the Spanish newspapers, it's the debate in Spain. We have too much tourists in Barcelona. We need to come back to the Industrial Revolution or something similar. How much you can say that this is good or bad for Greek, for Greece, for the Greek people also? The model can be changed. What is the, more or less the question is a bit, is, I think that is much more ambitious. What is the position of Greek in the next years in the world, the changing world economy? This is a quantitative question or this well, is I think the... that it's just speculative <laughs> and you cannot quantify. As I say to some of my students, if I can quantify this, I will put my money in the stock market and I will not teach in the LSE. Even then... Well, as far as I uh, know, the heavy industry for Greece, it's tourism. That's why I insisted that all the attractions are very helpful for the Greek economy and tourist attractions mainly have to do with nature and ancient monuments. So there is a future there. I can reverse the question and say that actually um, we cannot identify a Ottoman legacy uh, <laughs> to the present uh, level of tourism in Greece, but certainly the opposite is true. That is tourism was a factor that in a sense facilitated the success of the Greek War of Independence because it was through the tour, the, gra the Grand Tour, as it was called at the time, which British aristocrats were taking uh, in Italy and Greece to see the uh, uh, ruins of antiquity, uh, that the Greek cause of independence acquired a lot of its um, uh, support. Uh, it was the, the, the people who came to visit the Greek ruins prior to 1821 that popularized Greece that connected the Greek coast to Greek antiquity and that uh, were behind the mobilization of public opinion uh, in Western uh, Europe in favor of the Greek cause of independence, uh, which in turn uh, facilitated the intervention of Western powers in favor of Greece. So certainly we can say that tourism, the legacy of tourism had a big impact on the outcome of the Greek war of independence. Okay, thank you to everybody. We are run out of time. I enjoy a lot. I learn a lot about Greece. Thank uh, you very much. And it has been better than many, uh, many handbooks. I learned much more than reading the handbooks than we have in the market. Thanks to the speakers and thanks to the audience. I expect, I hope that everybody has enjoyed this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.